time to discuss the respiratory system. So we'll start with chapter 22, part one. So what is respiration? The respiration is defined as the exchange of gases. So the gases are most notably oxygen and carbon dioxide between the atmosphere, lungs, blood, and tissues. So essentially the uh, respiratory system provides extensive surface area for this gas exchange to occur between the air and the circulating blood. The respiratory system moves air to and from the exchange surfaces of the lungs, along with the respiratory passageways. This system protects respiratory surfaces from dehydration and temperature changes and other environmental factors. It produces sounds involved in speaking, singing, and other forms of communication. And finally, it facilitates the direction of olfactory stimuli. We learned in AMP1 about the olfactory nerve. And so those olfactory receptors, cranial nerve one, are in the superior portions of the nasal cavity. Here's a look at how thin air at high elevations can strain our respiratory system, making that process a little more difficult. So for those that are at a very high altitude, such as mountain climbers, something like that could apply to them. Here's another look at the functions that we just mentioned. So what specific organs and structures comprise the respiratory system? Well, the first thing that you should know is that there are two anatomical divisions of this system. We have the upper respiratory tract and we have the lower respiratory tract. You can see both of them on this picture. The upper respiratory tract is going to include the nose, the nasal cavity, as well as the paranasal sinuses, and the pharynx. And then the lower respiratory tract is going to be responsible for conducting air to and from the gas exchange surfaces. And so that's going to include the larynx, the trachea, also known as our windpipe, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. Okay, so there's a quick summary of what we just discussed. Once again, upper respiratory tract, sometimes abbreviated URT. Okay, here's another illustration, a little more close up there on the bottom, about some of the structures and features that we've discussed. And here is a close up detailed look at the upper airway. So let's talk about the upper respiratory tract here. So we know that this is gonna include once again, the nose, the nasal cavity, the paranasal sinuses and the pharynx. So let's break that down a little bit further into some more detail. So the nose, to start with the nose, it's the primary passageway for air that's entering the respiratory system when you are resting and breathing quietly. Okay, breathing is an autonomic process. So we just breathe, and we don't constantly think about our breathing, right? Now, uh, this is a really key part of the upper respiratory tract. The nose is gonna have the bridge of the nose. It's gonna have the nasal septum, the nasal cartilages, and the external nares of the nose. And then the nasal cavity is the space between these external nares and the internal nares, which are all the way at the back of the nasal cavity. So if you're interested, the nasal cavity is lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And remember, we learned about all the epithelial and connective tissue, as well as muscle tissue and nervous tissue in our previous course. Now we're seeing how all that applies as we talk more about physiology. The nasal cavity is going to contain the nasal vestibule, cribriform plate, the hard palate, the soft palate, the concha, the mediuses, which are the air passages from the external nares to the internal nares, and then the internal nares themselves. And then we have the paranasal sinuses. From AMP1, we learned that that includes the maxilla, the frontal, the ethmoid, and the sphenoid. And then we work our way down here to the pharynx, more commonly called the throat. Now note though that there's several regions of the pharynx, right? We have the nasopharynx, we have the oropharynx, and we have the laryngopharynx. 
And there's another look at the three regions of the pharynx. And this is a really nice picture because they're color coded and you can see them specifically. All right, so at the beginning of COVID, if you remember when uh, they were doing swabs at that point, really all the swabs at that point were nasopharyngeal swabs. So we go straight back all the way to the back here of the nasopharynx. And then a lot of the swabs started to become mid-turbinate swabs, which we go to about here, or simple nasal swabs, which just go in. And then lower respiratory tract. Let's look at that in some more detail. We know what it includes. Now let's look at some photos here. So the larynx is a very cartilaginous structure and it surrounds and protects our glottis. It's more commonly known as the voice box. You probably know of the larynx as the voice box. It also has a pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And you might be wondering what the glottis is. Well, the glottis is the point at which the inhaled air leaves the pharynx and enters the larynx. There's a narrow opening, which we call the glottis. So let's look at some of the cartilage that's really important. We have the epiglottis. Now, the important feature of the epiglottis is it covers over the glottis when someone's swallowing. That way that their food that they're swallowing doesn't enter the respiratory passageways. Then we have the thyroid cartilage. The important aspect here of the thyroid cartilage is it forms the walls of the larynx, particularly the anterior and lateral walls. And the name that you probably know of for the thyroid cartilage that's more common is the Adam's apple. And you might remember from AMP1, us talking about the hyoid bone. So the thyroid cartilage is actually connected to the thyroid bone by what we call the thyroid membrane. We also have something called the cricoid cartilage. And the job of the cricoid and the thyroid cartilages, cartilages are to protect the glottis. And we have some other cartilages here to note as well. The cricothyroid cartilage, the cricotracheal ligament, the tracheal cartilage. So as we continue our journey here in the lower respiratory tract, it's important that we also look at the vestibular and vocal ligaments. So these are bands of connective tissue that extend between the thyroid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilages. So we have the vocal folds, which you can see here, as well as the vestibular folds. So the vocal folds vibrate as air passes over them and they're therefore involved with the production of sounds. So here's an example here of the true vocal cords. And then a nickname for the vestibular folds are the false vocal cords. Then we move our way down to the trachea. So continuing through the lower respiratory tract, the trachea is also known as the windpipe. It's basically a tough, flexible tube and it conducts air toward the lungs. Its diameter is a couple centimeters, about two and a half centimeters, and it lies within the mediastium. And you can also see these little tracheal cartilages here. So those are little C-shaped rings. They're made of highline cartilage and they stiffen the tracheal walls and they also help to protect the airway and they come all the way down here. And then as we continue to move our way down, we have the bronchial tree. And so here we can see that we have a prim primary bronchi here on both sides. And this is a highly branching pattern of bronchi and bronchioles as well as they approach and travel through the lungs. Okay, so you can see the primary bronchi. The right primary bronchus is gonna be what transports the air to and from the right lung while the left primary bronchus is gonna be what transports air to and from the left lung. Then we have secondary bronchi as well, which you can see here. And you can see that the right primary bronchus branches to form the three secondary bronchi, one, two, three, while the left primary bronchus branches to form two secondary bronchi. And then we can extend on and we also have what's called tertiary bronchi. They're not labeled here, but just so you know, each secondary bronchus branches to form additional bronchi. And we call those tertiary bronchi. 
And then each tertiary bronchus is also responsible for delivering air to the single bronchial pulmonary segment. And then we work our way down to the lungs. So here, let's look at the gross anatomy of the lungs, and then we'll follow that with some physiology. So you can follow a lot of what we were just talking about as we work our way into the lungs. You know that the right lung has three lobes. We call it the upper or superior lobe, the middle lobe, and then the inferior lobe, while the left lung has two lobes, the upper or superior lobe and the lower or inferior lobe. Those terms can be used interchangeably. Noteworthy is that the left lung also possesses what we call a cardiac notch, which you can see here. And that's a curvature that allows for the heart to tilt to the left of the midline. So we talked earlier in the course about how the heart doesn't sit midline, how it tilts to the left. And once again, that cardiac notch is what allows that. Okay, this brings us back to our conversation a minute or so ago about the tertiary bronchi. So it's important to know that each tertiary bronchus delivers air to the single bronchial pulmonary segment, as we mentioned, and that branches repeatedly to give rise to these microscopic passageways called bronchioles. So bronchioles are really, really tiny. And what happens is the bronchioles will then lead to the alveolar sacs in the respiratory zone. Okay, and those, as you can see, are found down here. And that's where gas exchange occurs. So looking more on a microscopic level at the respiratory zone, you can see the structures that are all existing in that particular zone. So take a look at this picture and you can see that a couple of things that might strike you from what you've learned about in the past. We've learned about intercostal muscles in AMP1 and the directionality of those muscles. We also see here the chest wall, which comprises all of these things, the rib cage, the sternum, the thoracic vertebrae, as well as connective tissue and these intercostal muscles. So what happens and what allows us to differentiate between normal and asthmatic tissue? So we know that asthma, um, you know, asthma can be something that people are susceptible to. We want to know that normal lung tissue does not have the characteristics of lung tissue during an asthma attack. During an asthma attack, what happens is the mucosa becomes thickened, and then there's an increase in this mucus-producing goblet cell. All right, so the goblet cells become uh, thickened as well, and then there is an infiltration of the eosinophil. All right, this video is going to show you that in a little more detail. And then we'll jump here into the process of breathing. I'll let you watch that video on your own because I'd like to move now into pulmonary ventilation just to keep this video here on the lecture to a reasonable length. We wanna know that pulmonary uh, ventilation is driven by pressure changes within our pleural cavities. So several different pressures must be considered here. As you can see up on the screen, we have what we call atmospheric pressure. And that's the force exerted by the mixture of air that surrounds the body. Normal atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. And we talked about that in AMP1. We were talking about the essential elements for survival back in chapter one of AMP1. All right, in pulmonary ventilation, we also have the alveolar pressure, which is also known as the intrapulmonary pressure. And then, so that pleural is also within the pleural, pleural cavity. It's always several millimeters of mercury lower than the alveolar pressure. All right, and this allows the alveoli to be able to inflate. If the pressure in the pleural cavity rises, we call it pneumothorax, which can be a serious condition. So that's one of the pathologies that we'll look at in class. We'll do some sort of gallery walk activity, I'm thinking, where we'll go around with chart papers just so we can further research some of these pathologies that could occur um, you know, with regard to pulmonary ventilation. So now we'll make this, we'll take this a little more to a, complex, a higher complexity and we'll look at the inter, intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressure relationships. So the most important thing to know here is, as you can see in the caption, the alveolar pressure changes during the different phases of this cycle. 
In other words, during inhalation, which we know of as uh, our inspiratory muscles being at work, we have our inspiratory muscles controlling the inhalation. And what happens here is there's a contraction of the external intercostal muscles, which elevates the ribs and contributes to about 25% of the volume of air in the lungs at rest. And then we have this contraction of the diaphragm occur, which flattens the floor of the thoracic cavity, which is responsible for the other 75% of the air movement. Then at the same time, the, uh, the accessory inspiratory muscles are at work. And then we have the process of exhalation, which is the expiratory muscles that are at work, this process of passive activity, and the elastic forces and gravity are actually sufficient enough to reduce the volume of the lungs at that time. And uh, for forcible exhalations, we have ex um, accessory expiratory muscles including the internal intercostal, the transverse muscles, the external oblique, rectus abdominis, and the internal oblique muscles. Remember, air is gonna flow from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. So we know that during inspiration, the diaphragm would contract. During expiration, the diaphragm relaxes. That's important to know. Boyle's law. The key here is volume is inversely proportional to pressure. So what that means is as volume increases, as you can see in this picture, pressure decreases within the lungs. As volume decreases, pressure increases. And then if we make that more specific, if we reduce the volume of the thoracic cavity by half, the pressure within the thoracic cavity will double. Likewise, if we double the volume of the thoracic cavity, the pressure will decline by half. Okay, there's the inspiration and expiration example I gave just the different picture now. Both occur due to expansion and contraction of the thoracic cavity respectively. Okay, important units of measure to know, millimeters of mercury, as I mentioned several times now, this is the most common unit for reporting the blood pressure and the gas pressures. Normal, again, is 760. Then we have the tour, the centimeters of water, and the pounds per square inch. Those are common measurements that you'll see when we're talking about gas pressures in science. Okay, there's some factors that affect pulmonary ventilation. Ah, this is interesting, and I'd like to highlight this, the respiratory centers of the brain. As you know, we've talked previously about the nervous system. So let's bring the nervous system back in to talk about how respiration control involves interacting mechanisms of our brain stem, as well as the higher brain centers, and then the various receptors that our um, bodies pick up. So we have the respiratory rhythmic centers. All right, so here's where we have the reticular activating system. We have the medulla being a big part of that. We know that the medulla specifically is the reflex center for our respiration. So we also call the medulla the pacemaker to establish our pace of breathing. So in AMP2, the, we add a little bit of detail here. We talk about the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group. Okay, the dorsal respiratory group is what contains the neurons that actually control the lower motor neurons, which innervate the primary inspiratory muscles. And those are, as you remember from AMP1, it's opposite. Inspiratory muscles are the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm we also throw in there. Those are at the center of every respiratory cycle. So that all is originating from, directly from the medulla, part of the reticular activating system. Then we have the ventral respiratory group, which also stems down from the medulla. And here's where the inspiratory and expiratory centers are that function only when ventilation demands an increase and accessory respiratory muscles are needed. So that's the ventral respiratory group that is responsible for those things. Once again, 
when the ventilation demands increase and more respiratory muscles are needed. Even if there's damage, folks, to the brainstem, what happens is we also have higher brain centers that can compensate for that. All right, our higher brain centers are located in the cerebral cortex, the limbic system, the hypothalamus, both of which we learned about in AMP1 as well. So there's compensation there to a certain degree. And then what rounds out the respiratory centers as it relates to the nervous system are the different receptors. So baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, stretch receptors. And those receptors are picking up on sensitivities. They are altering activities of the respiratory centers as needed. They are responding to changes in the volume of the lungs. And they're offering protective reflexes that are triggered with an irritating stimuli, such as um, you know, the reflexes of coughing and or sneezing. Okay, here's a more detailed summary of those reflexes. So the different receptors there that we're talking about that we're mainly referring to when it comes to the respiratory system are the chemoreceptors, the baroreceptors, and the stretch receptors. Once again, bringing in elements of the nervous system there as well. So the partial pressures affect gas exchange between the lungs and the blood. So we have external respiration, and we also have the effect occurring uh, with the blood and tissues, and we call that internal respiration. All right, we know that when somebody is breathing out, we call that external respiration, and that's the exchange between the lungs and the blood. When somebody is breathing in, we call that internal respiration, and that is the exchange between the blood and the tissues. In other words, in, uh, in external respiration, the oxygen diffuses across the respiratory membrane. During internal respiration, the oxygen diffuses out of the capillaries and then into the cells. And then so conversely, carbon dioxide would diffuse out of the cells and into the capillaries. So how does this all begin? How does the respiratory system start up during embryonic development? Well, it's going to start up at about the fourth week of gestation. And then by the 28th week, enough alveoli have matured that when the baby's born, if the baby's born prematurely, the baby can most of the time breathe on their own, all right? But the respiratory system is not fully developed until early childhood. That's really important to know because that's when a full complement of mature alveoli is present. The timeline here is going to be at the fourth week, we have what we call the ectodermal tissue from the anterior head region, forming olfactory pits, which fuse with the endodermal tissue of the developing pharynx. We have other events happening at that point as well. And then we have a bronchial bud, which eventually becomes the bronchii. And then all the other lower respiratory structures begin to form. And then between week seven and 16, the bronchial buds continue to branch. And that progresses to the development of all segmental bronchi. And then beginning around week 13 or 14, the lumens of the bronchi expand in diameter. And then by week 16, the respiratory bronchioles, the little bronchioles form. So now the fetus has all the major lung structures at the end of week 16, which are involved in the management of their airway. And then progressing from week 16 to 24, we have the respiratory bronchioles leading to further development of vascularization, then the development of blood vessels and the formation of various ducts in the alveola. And that means as we approach week 20, fetal breathing movements could start, right? And those can be seen in the ultrasounds. And then from weeks 24 until the birth, additional major growth and maturation of the respiratory system will occur. And finally, we will discuss some disorders of the respiratory system as we approach part two. I'll see you in the next video.